The purpose of the Flick Reedy Education Enterprises is to promote individual moral responsibility through education. How do we do this? We study and discuss the interrelationships of history, philosophy, social studies, and economics. We do not dictate. We do not make statements as to what we think you should or should not do. We do not unduly burden this program with footnotes, references, or complete documentation. However, we do give sufficient data to bring this discussion into proper focus. We invite you to delve further into the necessary historical and statistical data to develop a deeper understanding of truth and a keener sense of individual moral responsibility. As we begin this final part of our meetings and discussions together, I hope you have an increased appreciation of how important you are as an individual. I hope also that you have quite a few ideas on how you, after reasonable study and preparation, can multiply your influence many-fold. Instead of spending time blaming people who don't seem to listen or care, let's take a searching look at ourselves. We must strive for perfection of knowledge and understanding and the ability to share these with others in a helpful, meaningful manner to them. As you manage to be helpful to a few, others will hear about it and also come to you. Then you can really begin to multiply yourself and your influence. Probably not more than 10% of the people in any country are needed to decisively influence the thinking of the other 90%. That's one in ten. You might as well be one of that ten percent. You can if you want to enough. Think about these statistics for a moment to see how broad the possibilities are. There are about two hundred million people in the United States of America, give or take a few million. How many of them would you estimate could be eligible to vote? Half of them? All right. Let's say roughly 100 million people could be eligible to vote if they wanted. In a recent presidential election, the total vote was the highest ever recorded, about 65 million. That leaves about 35 million people who could have voted but didn't, almost as many votes as the winner got. There was an ad in a magazine not long back. It had a picture of about 12 or 15 people. About half the people in the picture had no faces. The caption of the ad was, The Faceless Ones. The message was something like this. See the faceless ones. They are part of every crowd, every walk of life. They stand for nothing. Their interests are no deeper than their own pleasures. They talk much, but say little. They hold no convictions on politics, on religion, on life. Their concern is for themselves, not community, state, nation, least of all their fellow man. Crisis to them is no beer in the refrigerator or a run in one's stocking. Their feeling of public responsibility is small, their contribution even less. When decisions must be made, they can't be counted on because they will not be counted. They will not be at the polls next month. They are the faceless ones, part of every crowd. Perhaps this is too harsh. Maybe it's more accurate to say that thus far no person has provided them with a reason good enough to them to be counted on. Maybe you can be that person, can be that leader. It's a real challenge. Nothing worth doing is easy. Every vote counts. Yours as well as those whom you may have influenced. Many elections have been decided on by a very few votes. The U.S. Constitution was ratified by ten votes or less in four different states. Five states were admitted to the Union by the margin of a single vote. Several presidents were elected by the margin of a single electoral vote. A difference of only two or three votes per precinct 
would change the results of many and many an election. We return to another quotation from the recent book by Norman Vincent Peale, a noted theologian of our 20th century, who says, I believe that the average man, and I am one, needs to be educated and persuaded toward his responsibilities, and sometimes reminded of them. But I certainly do not think he is a grasping, selfish, stupid clod. I think there is in him a divine spark, that makes him want to be generous and decent and independent and self-reliant and free. I believe that it is deeply immoral to attempt to blunt these instincts in him or to assume that he does not have them. How are we qualified for the ideal of liberty? The English philosopher of our colonial times, Edmund Burke, included this in a letter he wrote in 1791 to a member of the French National Assembly. Men are qualified for civil liberty in exact proportion to their disposition to put moral chains upon their own appetites, in proportion as their love of justice is above their rapacity, in proportion as their soundness and sobriety of understanding is above their vanity and presumption in proportion as they are more disposed to listen to the counsels of the wise and good, in preference to the flattery of knaves. Society cannot exist unless a controlling power upon the will and appetite be placed somewhere. And the less of it there is within, the more there must be without. It is ordained in the eternal constitution of things that men of intemperate minds cannot be free. Their passions forge their fetters. We find this understanding in the inaugural address of President Grover Cleveland, Democrat, on March 4, 1885, which inaugural address included the following. He who takes the oath today to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States only assumes the solemn obligation which every patriotic citizen on the farm, in the workshop, in the busy marts of trade, and everywhere should share with him. Thus is the people's will impressed upon the whole framework of our civil policy, municipal, state, and federal. And this is the price of our liberty and the inspiration of our faith in the Republic. Any grouping of quotations on liberty and government would be incomplete without this next one. It was delivered on January 25, 1936, in Washington, D.C by Alfred E. Smith, who, in 1928, had been his party's candidate for U.S. President. Due to the length of this talk, we can only include some of the highlights. It is hoped that you will get the whole talk and read it from start to finish. He began, At the outset of my remarks, let me make one thing perfectly clear. I am not a candidate for any nomination by any party at any time. I am in possession of supreme happiness and comfort. I represent no group, no man, but I do speak for what I believe to be the best interests of the great rank and file of American people, in which class I belong. I am here tonight also because I have a great love for the United States of America. I love it above everything else for the opportunity that it offers to every man and every woman that desires to take advantage of it. No man that I know has any more reason to love it more than I have. It kept the gateway open for me. It is a matter of common knowledge throughout the country 
And I do not state it boastfully because it is well known that deprived by poverty in my early years of an education, that gateway showed me how it was possible to go from a newsboy on the sidewalks of New York to the governorship of the greatest state in the Union. Now listen. I have five children and ten grandchildren. And you take it from me. I want that gate left open. Not alone for mine. I'm not selfish about it, not for a minute. But for every boy and girl in the country. And in that respect, I am not different from every father and mother in the United States. When I see danger, I say danger. That is the stop, look, and listen to the fundamental principles upon which this government of ours was organized. It is difficult for me to refrain from speaking up. Recall that Al Smith spoke these words in 1936, 30 years ago. What dangers did he see? He continued, What are the dangers that I see? The first is the arraignment of class against class. It has been freely predicted that if we were ever to have civil strife again in this country, it would come from the appeal to passion and prejudices that comes from the demagogues that would incite one class of our people against the other. The next thing that I view as being dangerous to our national well-being is government by bureaucracy. Instead of what we have been taught to look for, government by law. It should be noted that several U.S. presidents from both political parties have recognized this problem during the past 30 years. One president appointed the Hoover Commission to study the problem. Other presidents had other studies made. But they were never very successful in reducing the established bureaucracy. In fact, the bureaucracy has continued to grow. Now, back to Al Smith. The next danger that is apparent to me is the vast building up of new bureaus of government, draining resources of our people in a common pool, of redistributing them, not by any process of law, but by the whim of a bureaucratic autocracy. During the next portion of his talk, Al Smith refers to government debt and who will pay it, coupling it with costly legislation and its results. Now here is something I want to say to the rank and file. There are three classes of people in this country. There are the poor and the rich. And in between the two is what has often been referred to as the great backbone of America. That is, the plain fellow. That is the fellow that makes from $100 a month up to the man who draws down five or $6,000 a year. Now there is a great big army. Forget the rich. They can't pay this debt. If you took everything they have away from them, they couldn't pay it. They ain't got enough. There's no use talking about the poor. They'll never pay it because they have nothing. This debt is going to be paid by that great big middle class that we refer to as a backbone and rank and file. And the sin of it is they ain't going to know that they're paying for it. It is going to come to them in the form of indirect and hidden taxation. It'll come to them in the cost of living, in the cost of clothing, in the cost of every activity that they enter into. And because it's not a direct tax, they won't think they're paying it. But take it from me, they are going to pay it. And the sin of this whole thing and the part of it that worries me and gives me concern is that this haphazard, hurry-up passage of legislation is never going to accomplish the purpose for which it was designed. And bear this in mind. Follow the platform under state laws. Next, Al Smith deplores how the actions of government have more nearly carried out the Socialist Party platform than the platform of the elected party. He concludes this part of his talk with these words. And incidentally, let me say that this is not the first time in recorded history that a group of men have stolen the livery of the church 
to do the work of the devil. Now, after studying this whole situation, you will find that that is at the bottom of all our troubles. This country was organized on the principles of representative democracy, and you can't mix socialism or communism with that. They are just like oil and water they refuse to mix. Now, I am going to let you in on something else. How do you suppose all this happened? Here is the way it happened. The young brain trusters caught the socialists in swimming, and they ran away with their clothes. Now, it is all right with me. It is all right with me if they want to disguise themselves as Norman Thomas or Karl Marx or Lenin or any of the rest of that bunch. But what I don't stand for is to let them march under the banner of Jefferson, Jackson, or Cleveland. Then Al Smith reviews briefly the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights, emphasizing the limitations on the powers of the federal government, and then identifies the trouble. As he continues, What's the trouble? Congress has overstepped its bounds. It went beyond that constitutional limitation, and it has enacted laws that violate the home rule and states' right principle. In the name of heaven, where is the independence of Congress? Why, they just laid right down. They are flatter on the congressional floor than the rug on the table here. They surrendered all of their powers to the executive. And that is the reason why you read in the newspapers references to Congress as the rubber stamp Congress. We must remember that despite this allegation by Al Smith, there was then, and has been ever since, a strong group of both senators and representatives who spoke their minds and convictions, which were and are contrary to the current of the times, and often contrary to the will of the president. In this conclusion, Al Smith speaks now to the members of the Congress, making several suggestions and concluding his talk. Six, I suggest that from this moment they resolve to make the Constitution the civil Bible of the United States, and pay it the same civil respect and reverence that they would religiously pay the Holy Scripture. Now, in conclusion, let me give this solemn warning. There can be only one capital, Washington or Moscow. There can be only one atmosphere of government, the clear, pure, fresh air of free America, or the foul breath of communistic Russia. There can be only one flag, the stars and stripes, or the red flag of the godless union of the Soviet. There can be only one national anthem, the Star-Spangled Banner, or the Internationale. You know that government is but the reflection of the thinking of the people who create it, and recreate it from time to time in history. If government is bad, it is partly the fault of everyone. And now, as we come to the close of our time together, I would only ask this. Tonight, or as soon as is possible for each of you, Go to the darkened room where your children or grandchildren lie sleeping. Observe in the dim light their wonderful forms, outlined by the contours of their blankets, the tousled hair, the peaceful repose of their faces. Observe and reflect on the confidence and faith they place in you. Never expressed, perhaps, but by their looks and acts, day in and day out the way they put their hands in yours. What heritage will you establish or help establish for them? What worldly goods can you guarantee that may not disappear before even you fulfill your time on this earth? Are such worldly goods so important? Are these youngsters not capable of earning such worldly goods for themselves, even if you cannot guarantee them? What more precious heritage can you leave them than the God-given freedoms which reached their flowering fulfillment 
in this great and glorious land of ours. As you leave that darkened bedroom, go directly to the first mirror you can find. Stand squarely in front of it. Look yourself straight in the eye and ask yourself, what am I willing to do?